Okay po, live na po tayo. I'll just um, do the edit. Throughout UPLB's more than 100 years of existence, it has worked in partnership with local and international organizations and institutions in the pursuit of excellence in instruction, research, and public service. Strong partnerships began when the then UP College of Agriculture and the College of Forestry, the first two colleges, established a food security program and became the home of the International Rice Research Institute. It was a partnership with Cornell University in the United States that made an indelible mark in the two colleges' development and history. The UPCA Cornell contract and the UP Cornell Graduate Education Program strengthened the critical mass of professional staff in UPLB. This graduate program was responsible for producing about 56 PhDs. UP became famous in Southeast Asia and staff development was so strong until we became UPLB with many colleges that started as huge departments of the College of Agriculture. As UPLB nurtured its traditional areas of strength, it unleashed its potentials in allied areas, growth points, and emerging fields, giving way to more partnerships and collaborations. UPLB envisions itself to be a globally competitive graduate and research university contributing to national development. As a national university whose niche programs are agriculture, forestry, environmental science, and veterinary medicine, UPLB is tasked to capacitate state universities and colleges. With integration becoming an urgent concern in the higher education arena, UPLB further intensified partnership building to enable it to collaborate in research and instruction, exchange materials, and enhance the mobility of faculty members and students. It now maintains partnerships with a significant number of regional and international educational institutions. UPLB can provide international linkages through its partners, through collaborations in research and academic programs, through student exchange programs, as well as complementation of its resources, including physical and human resources. We welcome partnerships in our niche programs from universities and institutions in the ASEAN region, as well as other countries around the world. As the higher education landscape shifts with time, UPLB will keep up by continually developing human resources, revitalizing programs for relevance, and promoting internationalization. In this highly globalized higher education arena, forming and nurturing partnerships for institutional dynamism and development is the way forward. Throughout UPLB's more than 100 years of existence, it has worked in partnership with local and international organizations and institutions in the pursuit of excellence in instruction, research, and public service. Strong partnerships began when the then UP College of Agriculture and the College of Forestry, the first two colleges, established a food security program and became the home of the International Rice Research Institute. It was a partnership with Cornell University in the United States that made an indelible mark in the two colleges' development and history. The UPCA Cornell contract and the UP Cornell graduate education program strengthened the critical mass of professional staff in UPLB. This graduate program was responsible for producing about 56 PhDs. UP became famous in Southeast Asia and staff development was so strong until we became UPLB with many colleges that started as huge departments 
of the College of Agriculture. As UPLB nurtured its traditional areas of strength, it unleashed its potentials in allied areas, growth points, and emerging fields, giving way to more partnerships and collaborations. UPLB envisions itself to be a globally competitive graduate and research university contributing to national development. As a national university whose niche programs are agriculture, forestry, environmental science, and veterinary medicine, UPLB is tasked to capacitate state universities and colleges. With integration becoming an urgent concern in the higher education arena, UPLB further intensified partnership building to enable it to collaborate in research and instruction, exchange materials, and enhance the mobility of faculty members and students. It now maintains partnerships with a significant number of regional and international educational institutions. UPLB can provide international linkages through its partners, through collaborations in research and academic programs, through student exchange programs, as well as complementation of its resources, including physical and human resources. We welcome partnerships in our niche programs from universities and institutions in the ASEAN region, as well as other countries around the world. As the higher education landscape shifts with time, UPLB will keep up by continually developing human resources, revitalizing programs for relevance, and promoting internationalization. In this highly globalized higher education arena, forming and nurturing partnerships for institutional dynamism and development is the way forward. Throughout UPLB's more than 100 years of existence, it has worked in partnership with local and international organizations and institutions in the pursuit of excellence in instruction, research, and public service. Strong partnerships began when the then UP College of Agriculture and the College of Forestry, the first two colleges, established a food security program and became the home of the International Rice Research Institute. It was a partnership with Cornell University in the United States that made an indelible mark in the two colleges' development and history. The UPCA Cornell contract and the UP Cornell graduate education program strengthened the critical mass of professional staff in UPLB. This graduate program was responsible for producing about 56 PhDs. UP became famous in Southeast Asia and staff development was so strong until we became UPLB with many colleges that started as huge departments of the College of Agriculture. As UPLB nurtured its traditional areas of strength, it unleashed its potentials in allied areas, growth points, and emerging fields, giving way to more partnerships and collaborations. UPLB envisions itself to be a globally competitive graduate and research university contributing to national development. As a national university whose niche programs are agriculture, forestry, environmental science, and veterinary medicine, UPLB is tasked to capacitate state universities and colleges. With integration becoming an urgent concern in the higher education arena, UPLB further intensified partnership building to enable it to collaborate in research and instruction, exchange materials, and enhance the mobility of faculty members and students. It now maintains partnerships with a significant number of regional and international educational institutions. UPLB can provide international linkages through its partners, through collaborations in research and academic programs, through student exchange programs, as well as complementation of its resources, including physical and human resources. We welcome partnerships in our niche programs from universities and institutions in the ASEAN region, as well as other countries around the world. 
As the higher education landscape shifts with time, UPLB will keep up by continually developing human resources, revitalizing programs for relevance, and promoting internationalization. In this highly globalized higher education arena, forming and nurturing partnerships for institutional dynamism and development is the way forward. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to the Hume 123 webinar entitled Unpacking the Value of Transdisciplinary Approach in Climate Change Adaptation and Disaster Risk Reduction. I will start by introducing myself. Some, most of you would know me as Mam Patch. I am Christina Cordero Bailey from the Department of Community and Environmental Resource Planning and one of the faculty uh, in charge of uh, Section W, if I remember my, correctly, uh, in, on the course uh, Climate Change Adaptation and Disaster Risk Reduction in Human Ecologies. Human, human ecosystems, I'm sorry. Um, I hope that everyone was able to have a good lunch um, and that we are all, at, we all have at least a satisfied tummy. And so right now um, for the next two hours, we are here to fill our minds naman, with a series of interesting talks that will show the, in, the transdisciplinary nature of the College of Human Ecology and exactly how each of our different specialties in our college actually work together to address the very important issue of climate change adaptation and disaster risk reduction. So let us now kick off um, this webinar with uh, some welcoming remarks from our Associate Dean, uh, Dr. Maria Teresa Talavera. Mam Tet? Hello. Hi. Okay, okay, so, okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, so on behalf of our Dean, uh, Dr. Ricardo Sandalo, let me welcome you to this webinar. Okay, actually, yung course na you may one, two, three. So we are glad to have you with us and thank you for attending this activity. So as you can see, the title of the webinar contains big words. Actually, kahit ako, even myself, sabi ko, oh, no, nabasa ko to, really big words. Okay, transdisciplinary. Climate change, climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction. So for me, these are all uh, these are big words actually. On its own, these concepts are quite big. Okay, but we are in this seminar trying to or webinar trying to unpack or understand these concepts together. So it's really good to have this course in the human ecology curricular program to facilitate our understanding about these concepts. As we are experiencing the effects of climate change, we do need to understand climate change adaptation, disaster risk reduction, transdisciplinary approach, but more importantly, we also need to act, diba? So we want to adapt to a, to a life or to life in a changing climate. We want to reduce our, vulner our vulnerability to the harmful effects of climate change. And then we also want to protect the lives and livelihoods of families and communities, especially those who are most vulnerable to disasters or emergencies. From my understanding, uh, especially, uh, we need to have a transdisciplinary approach wherein various stakeholders in various disciplines and sectors 
work together beyond our discipline. Okay, beyond our discipline and implement new language to achieve a common goal. So indeed, there is no denying we are in the midst of climate change. Even the COVID-19 pandemic has been linked with the climate change. While there is no direct evidence so far, we do know that climate change alters how we relate to other species and that matters to our health and our risk for infections. So there's also a, coming from nutrition discipline, there's also a nutrition and infection cycle which is applied now in understanding COVID-19. So with that, let me end here. And I hope we will have all a fruitful and informative uh, Saturday afternoon. So again, thank you for attending this webinar and thank you to the organizers as well. So back to you, Paul. Thank you so much, um, Mom, Dad, for opening our webinar and setting uh, the scene for the entire afternoon and what we will be tackling today uh, with our students and, and showing them how we actually work together po, and um, to make sure that we're actually, we can actually uplift and improve all of our um, adaptation measures and reduce uh, the, um, the, re the disasters that hopefully will not be too harsh in, uh, with us. Okay, I will sh continue my... Uh, so in the next point, we are now to give us an overview of the program and to actually also give the first talk um, for today. Uh, is none other than our Professor Ron J. P. Dangkalan from the Department of uh, Social Development Services. Prof Professor Ron is a political economist and a human ecologist. He is an assistant professor at the DSDS, College of Human Ecology in UP Los Banos. He's a founding member of the Interdisciplinary Studies for Water based at the UPLB School of Environmental Science and Management and a co-investigator of an EGAP-funded COVID research on health policy compliance at the UP Resilience Institute. Since August of 2020 to the present, he is a foreign researcher under Dr. Quinn, is that correct? Quinn Lee's laboratory at the Institute of Economic Research in the Seoul National University. So uh, this afternoon, Sir Ron will be, uh, besides talking about giving us an overview, he will also talk about the, applying the transdisciplinary and systems approach in CAA and DRR. So Ron, please take it away. Thank you so much, Ma'am Patch. No? And I think uh, Asok Dintet already explained <laughs> what is a transdisciplinary approach. Thank you, Ma'am Tet. No? Ma'am Tet really uh, had a very beautiful definition already, and I think she got it right already. Now, so um, I'll just give an overview of our presentations for this afternoon. So I'll set the tone on why are we coming here together. There's Nutri, there's uh, Community and Environmental Resource Planning, there's also Social Technology, and of course, the Family uh, and Human Development. Why are they all here? when we try to look into uh, climate change adaptations and DRR. And of course, we will have uh, human nutrition in CCADRR, very relevant topic. I know a lot of practitioners are really wanting to uh, see it. And I saw uh, some practitioners who are also here since this is open to the public, not just our students. Um, Dr. Amy Barion will talk about it. And of course, death and disasters. Uh, what about the social services side of debt-related um, services no? under the four thematic areas of DRM? It will be given by Ma'am Emmy Mendoza. And building back smarter communities post-extreme event, we have Mr. Ben Aguijon from the uh, UN Habitat Philippines. And we'll have a reactor all the way no? coming from Eastern Summer State University and also no, maraming ikakwentong personal also. Uh, her own personal experiences of disaster, si uh, Dr. Blesilda Badok. No? 
and we'll have an open forum with Prof. Chris Malenab and a closing remark by Prof. Meme uh, de Mesa. Okay, I'll go directly into my presentation. As, and as Ma'am Tet said, no, there's a lot of big concepts that are here, but there are actually something that is very practical, that are very practical and something that we can uh, understand and um they're not just a matter of semantics, but also I think they are very important in shaping how we frame CCADRR, not just in terms of our analysis, but also in terms of practice. Um, there are three stories contained in this presentation. One is the human ecology story. And I think it's very important that we try to understand why we are all here together. As I said, I, I'm setting the tone. The other one is the transdisciplinary and systems approach story. Is this just another semantic? Or when we say transdisciplinary approach, it's at the very core, at the very heart of human ecology. When Ellen Swallow Richards envisioned it um, in the Lake Placid conferences uh, during the turn of the century. Then I learned this from Dr. Michael Pido. I think Prof. Eva from Palawan State is here right now in the audience. Something new that I learned, super wicked problems. Now, we learned about wicked problems, but now Dr. Michael Pido was saying super wicked problems. No? And I think this is all relevant on how we apply human echo and the transdisciplinary and systems approach to address these super wicked, super wicked problems, not just in the academe, but also in practice. Looking back at the history of human ecology, of course, uh, this was inspired by the talk of um, Dr. Sherry Ann Chapman at the University of Alberta to celebrate the 100 years of home economics and human ecology in Alberta in honor of Dr. Elizabeth M.P., who was a nutritionist, by the way, and Professor Emerita of Home Economics at Alberta. She said that the knowledge of our history in home, human ecology and home economics is not a luxury because it's very important in preserving and interpreting that history for our profession to survive. And I don't think it's not just about, it's just about survival, but it, we also affirm the strength of human ecology and its relevance today in the 21st century, given these super, super wicked problems and why human ecology matters. There are four major references that I use and I invite you to read if you want to understand why human ecology is important and relevant and why human ecology is transdisciplinary in nature and why all of us, no? HFDS, IHNF, DSDS, and DSERP are all part of one family. And these are some of the major references that I, I show. No? There are many interpretations also of what human ecology is and the human ecology story and the CCADRR story. And I offer one of this interpretation coming from my own uh, unique, uh, my own uh, standpoints, from a human ecology worldview, from a philosophy and humanities worldview that asks the why, the nature of knowledge and inquiry and truth, and the political economy worldview to also understand when human ecology was developing and CCADRR, what are the development and political milieu that actually shape social and disciplinary changes. Human ecology story. From the very beginning, human ecology was a call to action. No? Ellen Swallow Richards, the mother of human ecology, was the first graduate of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and she was a chemist. She used the word ecology for her new field. And when she used her new field, she was so born in a world where there's industrialization, there's a lot of people moving from rural to urban areas, People's lives are basically changing because remember, this was 1900s America when a lot of industrialization was happening and people were changing. Now people's lives are changing. And one of the major concerns was food. That is why we are saying that nutritionists are human ecologists. Because from the very beginning when human ecology was, con con was um, conceived, there was a question of a lot about food with this industrialization. There's no ways of consuming food. The control of food preparation shifted from private domain in the household now to industries. At the time, with manufacturing, they, they are producing canned foods, right? And there was concern of whether these foods are nutritious enough. And of course, with the emergence of these new lifestyles, it also created new problems, including new illnesses. The founders of human ecology were concerned about these changes. And the concern of the founders of human ecology Paano magbe-benefit ang mga individuals and their families and not just the industries that were profiting from these new modes of consumption. 
human ecology is beyond the productionist paradigm of produce, 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 produce. It's always concerned about human welfare and social justice. Human ecology is concerned about the near home. What is happening within the home? That's why there's nutrition in us. That's why there's social technology in us. There's family and human development in us and how we integrate with the bigger system. That's why we have community and environmental planning with us. But unlike other fields that is mostly concerned with the science, we're also concerned about ethics and social justice. Because when human ecology was formed, again, what Ellen Swallow Richards was thinking in this new life world that is happening with the industrial age in, the, in North America, how can it be just and how can it benefit people ultimately? The Lake Placid Conferences was very instrumental in shaping what would be human ecology. Na? When Ellen launched it, he proposed many terms at, as Dr. Sue McGregor actually noted in, his, uh, in her paper. Now, I read a lot of paper by Dr. Sue McGregor and it was very enlightening of what is really human ecology. Ellen Swallow Richard proposed the term ecology, but dahil babae siya, and it was already used in the British Medical Journal, it was doomed to fail. And the ecology world, world will not uh, prosper. He, she also used human ecology, home ecology, and many other concepts and many other terms that would mean the interface of systems of the environment and human beings in the home. No? So instead, Ellen Swallow Richards came into domestic science because that was the only place at that time that was available for women. And in the late Placid Conferences, they established what would be home economics. And that includes nutrition. Yeah? And that's why um, when home economics was born in 1908, it was actually not just homemaking, but it's also about the interfaces of human life at home with the systems and their physical environment. And it would take another half a century before that ecology angle that Ellen originally envisioned would actually happen. Home ecology it, it would happen in the 1970s when home economics faculties would actually change their name deliberately to home human ecology. So it took us a little bit of delay before we can actually accept the idea of Ellen Swallow Richards. I go now to the transdisciplinary uh, story, yeah? to the story of transdisciplinary systems and approaches. Okay. When we say transdisciplinary, what do we mean? Is it just a shift in, 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 it's just another semantic or it is different in its own right? When you say transdisciplinary, I like this uh, demonstration by Heinzmann and I think Dr. Tet brilliantly explained this already. When you say transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary does not just combine discipline as in multidisciplinary research. It does not just combine separate perspectives to form one perspective. Transdisciplinary perspective goes beyond discipline in co-producing new knowledge. I like the definition most by Dr. Sue McGregor. Dr. Sue McGregor says, said that transdisciplinary means knowledge is produced between, across, beyond, and even outside academic disciplines. So knowledge co-production exists even outside universities. I'm looking at Dr. Dybul and Carlson's article in 2017. And they were saying that in the 1970s, only, that's the only time when transdisciplinary knowledge actually, or the transdisciplinary term came out. But Ellen Swallow Richards, when you look at her writing, she was inviting civil engineers, people from the community, non-academics, to actually participate in her new discipline, which she called human ecology, home ecology, but hindi nga pinayagan, kaya naging home economics. So in essence, human ecology from the very, very beginning was transdisciplinary, even before the transdisciplinary concept was developed, according to Dr. Dybul and Carlson. Very interesting article that I can share to everyone later on. For better visualization, before I apply it to climate change, how does an interdisciplinary and a transdisciplinary approach make a most difference? I'm interested in healthcare research, and that is why I'd like to show some healthcare example. In an interdisciplinary setting, a patient was just a source of data. It's all the doctors from different disciplines that are talking 
and ikaw, kuhaan ka lang ng data. And when the gastroenterologist, anesthesiologist, the colorectal surgeon, and the clinical nutritionist talks, the treatment plan will be given to patient. This is an interdisciplinary form in practical, in very, very practical terms is actually happening. In a transdisciplinary approach, it is very different. From the very beginning, the patient is not seen as a source of data, but a co-producer of knowledge that is has the ability to make co-decisions. And when you say co-decisions, the patients are allowed siguro, to read journals. Patients are actually allowed to see, uh, to, to, uh, are allowed to question, allowed to make uh, inquiry on very medical issues. And the treatment plan is actually shared with the patient. A transdisciplinary, when Ma'am Emmy and I were talking sometime, sabi ko sa kanya, there's no field that is where transdisciplinary approach is so practical than medicine. Because many studies are already pointing out, I'm showing here a very small sample study by Benick, that in the case of quality improvements in hospitals, for example, using a transdisciplinary approach, make hospitals aware of the urgency of the need to improve healthcare services. A transdisciplinary approach is this practical. It might be a very, very, very big term, but also it is very practical in nature. And human ecology as a transdisciplinary approach that includes nutrition, family and human development studies, community environmental research planning and social technology is something that we have to treasure. No? Our, our friends in Diliman and UANP were saying, we are going trans. No? From inter, we're going trans. In human eco, trans na tayo. No? And this is the very practical application of what we mean by a transdisciplinary approach. This is a paper that will come out that was co-authored by Prof. Emmy and I and Sir Gillian. When we say transdisciplinary, what are then the implications? First, it facilitates genuine co-creation, where communities are not just seen as sources of data, but co-producers of knowledge. It allows for genuine stakeholders to uh, engagement, and it also allows planners and communities, particularly in DRR, the ability to see connections in complex, complex and wicked problems. Now, to the super wicked problems such as climate change and disasters. We know no, that uh, super wicked problems are characterized by ambiguity, no, by the, the problems in itself are symptoms of another. And in these very complex problems like climate change, for example, where 35 million people are affected by flood, floods, 821 million people are undernourished. It, it's not just confined to nutrition, to ur urban planning, to social services, not just to the family and psychosocial um, analysis, we need a transdisciplinary approach that is actually co-shared with the community. No? When we look at disasters as well, when you look at disasters, it's a super wicked problem because flooding, for example, is a symptom of poor urban planning, no? of poor management of drainage. You say, sabi ko nga kanina kay Ma'am Amy, no? there's a lot of uh, malnourished people that are you know, being recorded after uh, a disaster and malnour being malnourished is part of um, the consequences of disasters. And but that's why we need nutrition people to also deal into the questions of disasters. And what human ecology does in trying to deal with this increasing gravity of disasters that are happening now in the world is for us to be able to use full force, no? all of our different approaches coming together to come up with a holistic intervention that is not that not just all of us, the four departments in institute talking, but also the community. And I think this is something that we should appreciate, especially given the increase in disaster incidences that are happening all across the board. They're increasing. No? The human ecology framework is this. And when we say human ecology framework, I let the other speakers later on discuss the nitty gritty of it. But the human ecology framework has a reason. Why? Social services are here. Why nutrition is here? Sabi nga natin, from the very beginning of human ecology, nutrition was a concern. Na? And of course, environmental integrity, pollution, nakita natin, ang daming problem na, that Ellen Swallow Richards is talking, talking about the family and of course, social technology. When we looked at the CHEP framework, 
We believe that a resilient social ecological system has a food, security, nutrition, and human health aspect to it. Ma'am Tet already mentioned it, and I think Ma'am Amy will look into it. We need thriving families and we need human development to ensure resilience in our social ecological system. We also need to build back smarter communities, and Ma'am Amy later, and which Ben will later on discuss. And we need to have adequate social services and participatory approaches and strong institutions to be able to mainstream these approaches. The human ecology approach is not just semantic, it's not just an idea, but if we really make a, take advantage of it and if we really use it to really solicit also no, the perspectives of the community in this co-creative process, it can actually make a lot of difference. And I was reading again into Ellen Swallow Richards' works. Ano ba yung kaibahan natin sa sustainability science, sa environmental science and the rest? Because human ecology from the very beginning was always concerned with the near with the intimate, with the personal, and the near home. And um, mamaya, babalikan ko yan yung concept, patapos na ako. No? There are tools in human ecology, Prof. Eva is here, and they demonstrated some of the examples of what we have with systems approach. Sesame with Palawan State University and the University of Queensland. It can help capture those complex interfaces. We are also using the human ecology approach no? with the causal loop diagramming. Um, this was with the UP Resilience Institute that we are doing on COVID. No? Um, these are just some of the examples of how human ecology in itself as a field. We have our own uh, tools, we have our own methods, and of course the systems part, the social ecological part, which we borrow is also very human ecological. Now before I end this presentation, I'd like to ask why everyday life is more important than ever. Human ecology is a study of human environment relations, but also human ecology at the same time is concerned with everyday life, with near home. Because galing tayo, di ba, sa, sa home economics. It's concerned with everyday life. And I think it's more important than ever. In an age where there's big data, very impersonal, treating people merely as numbers. We need human ecology na maibaba natin ko yung CCADRR, that human beings are not just data, but we are human beings with dignity. Nilagay ko din dito X-Men Apocalypse because we're facing a lot of complex and wicked problems. Then human ecology is something that we need. I'll end this presentation, a very short presentation with these two, three stories. Again, why are we here as human ecologists? And why should we affirm our story as a field. Why do transdisciplinary and systems approach matter? Are they matter of semantics or are they at the very core when human ecology as a field was conceived by Ellen Swallow Richards and the brave woman who said human ecology is always a home for women? Because when women were marginalized in traditional sciences, they found their home in human ecology. And it was women who actually championed human ecology. I'll tell you, the University of Alberta one of the pioneers was a nutritionist of human ecology and home economics there, Dr. Elizabeth MP, for whom the, UA, the U of A uh, MP lecturer was named, and she's a nutritionist, by the way. So how do we collectively deal and thrive amid super wicked problems such as climate change and disasters? Our next speakers will tell that using the human ecological lens. So looking back into our history, our history as human ecology is not a luxury because we know that there's a lot of, there's a lot of debate and is human ecology still relevant in the 21st century? But I think it's very important that we preserve and interpret our history, not just for human ecology as a discipline, but for a world that is becoming more complex, more connected, and filled with super wicked problems. Maraming salamat po, and I hope you all have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sir Ron, for that very comprehensive uh, lesson on human ecology. And not just a lesson, you showed us exactly how other fields, like in the field of medicine, that we actually, they, they really should work together on, on not just as the different um, specialists, but taking into consideration paano nga, uh, kailangan makapag-input rin ang mga pasyente to what their treatment is. So, thank you very much for that very nice um, setting that you have set, that you have uh, presented to us for uh, this afternoon. And hold on, I'll sh share my screen again.
So now let us move on to a very essential topic for all of us. Hindi tayo mabubuhay kung wala tayong pagkain. <laughs> so here we will, uh, Dr. Amy Sheri Barion will share with us about uh, nutrition in emergencies. Dr. Barion is a professor and uh, one of our new UP scientists here at the Institute of Human and Human Nutrition and Food in our college. She is also the current um, director of the institute. Dr. Barion has served as editor in chief of the Human of the Journal of Human Ecology and the Journal of Nutritionist Dietitians Association of the Philippines. And she has conducted many public service and extension works with various organizations and institutions, both locally and internationally. And um, um, so now we are here to uh, see the approach of the human nutrition in uh, CCADRR. And Ma'am Aini, Ma the floor is yours na po. Thank you, Ma'am Ma Bailey. So, good afternoon. First and foremost, I would like to thank uh, Yume123 for inviting me to be one of your resource speakers. So, ang ganda-ganda nung ano kanina, nung talk ni... Nawala ako, kala ko audience lang ako. Magsasalita na pala ako. Ako na pala next. Ang ganda-ganda ano... I was really listening sa sa overview ni Sir Ron and I would like to hear more. Ang ganda ng ano nung ending talaga. How can we collectively deal with this super wicked problems? Imagine hindi lang problems ang description pa may super na may wicked pa. Talagang insabihan it's really something na very big and it's very hard. Siguro as human ecologist and nutritionist talagang ano din. Maganda din yung quote niya yung everyday life is more important than ever. Siguro ko ililink lang natin pareho. Siguro one day at a time. One step at a time. Because it's really very hard. Uh, we live in a very uncertain uncertain world, di ba? Lalo na ngayon, uh, buka. Buka world tayo. So really, it's very hard to plan. Very, very hard to uh, look at the future because uh, what is important uh, is the present at the moment kasi nga very uncertain. There, there are so many things happening in our environment. Now, uh, my topic is on nutrition and emergency. Actually, when I was invited, I was asking the faculty members, what do you expect me to deliver in terms of uh, CCA, uh, DDR, so, uh, climate change adaptation? So uh, the first thing I thought is our lecture on nutrition and emergency. What is the function of a nutritionist dietitian and how we go about it? No, So I know many people are asking, siguro, uh, paano nga yung delivery ng pagkain during emergencies, ano ang nutritional consideration, things like that. So I will be giving you a practical, a very practical side on how we function as nutritionist dietitian during climate change adaptation and during emergencies and disasters, like for example in our Philippines. So I'll just um, share my screen. So to give an overview, we have what we call nutrition management in emergencies and disaster. And in our field, uh, maybe it's uh, um, just to give an overview. No, so we we remember we talk about emergency and differentiating emergency with disaster. We say emergency when it's really very sudden, no? Sudden and there's an urgent need to respond. And the community and the society can still actually respond given the resources as compared sa disaster. Pag disaster na talaga, it's really overwhelming. Uh, the impact exceeds the capacity of the the community or society to cope and there is massive loss no there's a serious disruption of function in the community uh, there's widespread losses in terms of human in terms of economic in terms of materials in terms of the environment so it's really very hard to cope so it's already termed as disaster now, we have different types of disasters. So just to go over as part of the overview, we have, the, of course, the natural one. We know that our uh, country, the Philippines, is know, very much susceptible to a lot or different sorts of calamities. 
we experience a lot of typhoons averaging 20 type uh, typhoons per year so we have man made so we also have some uh, issues with regards to our our political conflicts technological disasters and nutrition is necessary during times of disaster to prevent malnutrition. Kasi remember, di ba, food is one of the basic necessities. So before you can do anything, before you can function to survive, to live, food is very important. So our primary objective is during disaster and emergency is to prevent death and malnutrition. So kasi pag ano, pag when you are malnourished or undernourished, you become weak. Your immunity subsides. So bumababa yung immunity mo. Mas lalo kang nagiging prone sa mga diseases sa sa mga infection. So baka yung katabi mo, mahatsingan ka lang, ma'am niya, nag-fever ka na or something like that. Kasi nga, you are undernourished. Your nutritional status is poor because of poor food intake, maybe because of absence of food, because of what's happening in our environment. So mas lalong nagkakaroon ng casualties. Eh di ba ito nga ang ano natin, uh, human resource is one of the most important resource we have. So as much as possible during emergencies and disaster, eh, wala, walang mamamatay, no casualties. So it is necessary to prevent uh, the worsening uh, nutritional situation. So paano natin ginagawa yun? So we have this term emergency feeding, supplying food or meals to persons made destitute or otherwise deprived of access because of what's happening, calamities, emergencies, disasters. So our situational analysis, we try to see that people are usually displaced in their homes following disasters. No, People are stressed, anxious, in some cases shocked. Actually, uh, during the first onset, actually the next slide, pala yun. Sige, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll discuss it later. People are temporarily housed in crowded evacuation shelters. Facilities and spaces are inadequate. Evacuees may have various health problems. May sipon, inuubo, nilalagnat na, or may mga open wounds na nagkakos ng mga dehydrated, may open wounds na nagkakos ng mga infection, and later nakakaroon ng fever, magkakahawa na, things like that. So our aims uh, in emergency feeding are the following. Of course, first and foremost is we want to preserve life itself kasi nga, di ba, human resource is very important maintain the morale of the people, not only physiologically, but we have to also talk about mental health. So you have to have a good nutrition to help your uh, our mental health and relieve conditions of casualties. Now, we have three stages in emergency feeding. We have the early, the immediate, and the extended. Actually, sa totoo lang, no? pag immediate naman, I hope you can imagine such the scenario and we never have, uh, we'll never experience having yung first-hand experience of yung emergencies and calamities. The early stages describe as uh, food supplies is automatically, immediately cut off. no. So there's no productive work available and it will last for about a day or two. Our objective is to provide something to eat, improve the morale, and help counteract shock. Actually, immediately after emergency and disaster, hindi naman food ang priority kaagad ng tao eh. Uh, the priority is, you can just imagine, is to see whether your loved ones, your relatives are safe. Diba? Hinahanap mo muna sila. Hindi naman, di ba nagkaroon ng disaster, emergency, hindi naman pagkain kaagad ang hahanapin mo. You want to secure your family members, your loved ones, no? And then after that, you want to secure your house, your home, your resources. And then siguro later na yung pagkain. So kasi yun nga yung parang shock eh. Hindi naman immediately nagkaroon ng disaster. Ay, wala na akong kakainin. Hindi, di ba? Ang hinahanap natin immediately, our loved ones. We want to secure our our loved ones and our resources. And then part na doon, yung pagkain. And so during the early part, the calamity, we actually, ang ating priority groups and nutrients are actually carbohydrates, beverages, and soups. For the intermediate uh, stage, this is the situation uh, far from normal, but over na sa shock. No? So we give provision of food. Uh, relief packages, so provide uh, nutritious foods for temporary ma uh, maintenance and it should not exceed for about two weeks. So special consideration given to full vulnerable group like uh, small children, the elderly, the pregnant, the lactating, and those who have ano talaga, uh, illnesses, illnesses or diseases. So we provide aside from carbohydrate, protein sources already. And then for the extended, we provide the complete 
nutrients, carbohydrates, protein, fats, uh, vitamins, and minerals. So the, our objective here is to sustain life and maintain the normal health and diet. So it actually exceeds more than two weeks. So how are foods given during disasters? So meron mga iba-ibang category. One is dry ration. When family members are evacuated, foods are actually raw. Like raw, raw foods are given. Example, mga rice, noodles. No? Um, yung dry rations, usually uh, it is being adopted pag yung mga people do not want to go to the evacuation centers. They, are, they do not want to leave their houses kasi nga yung security ng bahay tsaka ayaw din nila sa evacuation center kasi nga siksika naman, kulang ang CR, so might as well stay dun sa kanilang house. No? So what the community, society, local government is to give dry ratio. So ang assumption dyan is since nasa bahay pa sila, meron pa silang capacity to prepare their food. And then yung iba namang nasa evacuation center, we have mass feeding, we provide community kitchen. So may centralized community kitchen for the preparation of the food. And then we have complementary feeding and therapeutic feeding for those na meron talagang need. Uh, small children, infants, uh, therapeutic, may mga special diets na needed for those uh, diet-related diseases like kidney problems, cardiovascular, uh, things like that. Now, the sources of food basically comes from our government, the SWD, local government units. And then there are some donations no, from different groups, NGOs. Um, uh, several uh, people are actually donating food. Actually, may apprehension kami dun sa donations din from people kasi uh, we have to ensure food safety because sometimes, of course, we know na hindi naman nila intent no, na mag-deliver na something. Kaya lang, minsan yung traveling time or na-store yung food item, sometimes, tsaka it's cooked in bulk, uh, there, are, there is actually high chance na baka magkaroon ng foodborne illness pa dun sa food poisoning. Kasi nga, you are providing large quantity of food items. You do not know the holding time, uh, temperature abuse of yung food items sometimes happen. Of course, siguro hindi naman yun yung intent nung nag-donate. Pero yun nga, uh, sometimes uh, it might uh, lead to that. Kaya very careful ang local government units in terms of, uh, siguro you've heard it yun sa mga news minsan, yung parang nire-restrict or you have to ask permission pa sa LGU pag mag-donate ka ng certain uh, food items kasi siguro ito ang kanilang ano dito uh, you have to safeguard in terms of food poisoning now the our government the SWD um, gives an average of yung one food pack it's actually good for family of five and it can last for about two to three days and ito yung content. Siguro you're wondering, no, yun nga, yung rice. Kanina nga tinatanong ako ni Sir Ron, no, bibigay yan, eh, hindi wala nga lulutuan. No? Yung rice, coffee, uh, instant noodles. No? Kasi yung isang consideration talaga dito, basic, yung shelf life. Uh, this type of food items can last uh, long, um, three months, six months, to one year. No? No? And then, um, Actually, ang cost din. No? The cost of this in 2015, the cost is actually around 300. But because of inflation, siguro ngayon kung i-calculate niya, it's uh, around 500 na siguro, 400 to 500 na yung cost. No? And then this actually provides the basic uh, uh, nutrients like carbohydrates, a little bit of protein, fats to provide energy. No? Energy and a little bit of vitamins and minerals. Talagang for ano? for a few days substance na ano na hindi naman siya for live na hindi siya for for long period of time no so yun yung isang um ano niya essence niya so characteristics of food during emergency feeding yun nga yung one is it should be easy to cook uh, when we say easy to cook basically hot water uh, minimum ng hot water uh, like boiling rice, mga ganun. Can be cooked in bulk or in one container, like yung nga, mga noodle soup. No? So it's appealing to all age group. Pwede siyang pambata, pwede siyang pang matanda. And it's simple enough and, enough and culturally acceptable. Now, in terms of uh, technology, actually marami nang nagawa. No? DOST, FNRI, for instance, no? in 2015, uh, they've started launching uh, ready to eat food items. Ito na para ma-answer na nga yung walang cooking preparation, uh, walang cooking area. So ready to eat, ready to eat convenient food items. So they categorize this different um ready to eat food items uh category A. Ito talaga yung no prep, yung category B, 
something that you can nibble on, pero you need drinkables. So, like biscuits, cookies, yung maninibol mo na para meron ka kahit pa paano calorie source of carbohydrates, energy, a little bit of fat, a little bit of protein, no? and so on and so forth. So, these are examples. So, they have yung mga ready-to-eat chicken arroz caldo. Uh, they have uh, ready-to-eat corn soup. Uh, ito, yung mga ano, ri, ano, brown rice bar. Parang chocolate bar siyang ganun. So, it contains around 200 to 300 calories. So, it's good for, uh, it provides 30% of your calorie requirement for the day. Enough to give you energy to do your work. Meron ding mga choco bar, vegetable-based choco bar, vegetable-based uh, pulburon, mga micronutrient mix and mga instant meals. Actually, we conducted also a study. So, together with um, Wellbert, uh, Ma'am Mi, Ma'am Mopera, so we um, developed uh, using saba peel para may fiber, uh, mongo peel, uh, mongo malunggay for vitamins and iron, no? uh, flour, full, uh, full boron bar. So, yung na-develop namin actually can last for about 100 11 days or more or less mga 3 months no shelf stable at 30 degrees celsius so 3 months lang yung stability niya kasi nga ang factor ngayon talaga sa ready to eat is yung stability uh, yung food item can last at room temperature you do not need to refrigerate it no pwede siyang sa pantry lang sa table sa cabinet and it can last for about 3 to 1 year so yun yung parang uh, consideration natin for ready to eat food items Oh, pero ang comment namin diyan just to share no po buron hindi ba kailangan ng tubig kasi di ba parang <coughs> ma, ma ano ka uh, ang tawag ito yun mabubulunan ka kasi it's something dry no so tama naman water is needed nga so siguro category ano siya category B something that can be nibbled nibbled on pero you need some drinkables no ang water naman kasi talaga basic di ba kahit nga sabi natin di ba kahit walang pagkain basta may tubig you can survive for how many days no And then these are other, uh, if you're wondering, no, these are other um, ready-to-eat food items developed by our government, POST, FNRI. Actually, ano na, ashe, for emergency and actually, ano siya, uh, these are also prepared for military, for military use. Uh, hindi lang for emergency or uh, both din, pero ang isa ding ano nito, ang isa ding use nitong mga to is for military use pag nasa field sila, nasa combat, nasa uh, nasa mountains or mga areas na talagang lim very limited din yung food production. So yon, eto yung mga products nila. Now, this was launched um 2020 and 2021 just recently. Pero last year I think some of these items were already launched. So inintroduce na and I think they are developing marketing strategies na kung paano and yung cost also. Like for example itong Nutriban, it cost around uh, 180 grams siya eh. Uh, it cost around 10 pesos and 15 pesos. So they're still thinking on maybe lowering pa the price to 5 pesos or 10 pesos less. no? And then, of course, yung shelf life, yung stability. How long can this ban last? Kasi nga, emergency and disaster, eh, di ba? Baka nga walang cooking. And yun nga, sa military, so nasa liblib na lugar, nasa bundok. So, hoping na it will last for about 3 months, 6 months, or 1 year. So, yun yung mga consideration. And then, These are things also unraveled by DOST. You can check out their site. Ito yung sinasabi kong ano, yung mga bar na parang ready to eat. So, very convenient. Uh, very small siya, pero compact siya in nutrients. So, you can place it in your pocket, in your bag. So, tapos light lang yung weight niya. Tapos ang shelf life nga niya, it can last for about a year, six months to one year. So, yan. Other products. So there are also studies uh, uh, that evaluated the adequacy of these food aid packs. And in terms of calories, they provide a, a, a more or less mga 50% to 100% of yung caloric requirement per day given the different age group. So meron namang evaluation na ginawa in regarding vitamin A, iron. So it provided um, more or less to, uh, 30 to 50% of yung requirement per day. So, ang guidelines naman natin in managing community kitchen, no? so you have to consider the site. Usually, clear and open siya. No? With, uh, dapat ang requirement natin may well 
drain ground floors, may may provision ng shade, uh, close to people to be fed, accessible sa mga supply at sa mga roots, and of course, merong adequate safe water to use. And then yun nga, yung mga toilet facilities no, for sanitation purposes. So you have to check the layout. So these are generally our requirements for managing a community kitchen. But of course, in reality, sometimes hindi rin talaga nafa-follow kasi given nga na ang reality, eto lang ang available na. Usually, ang mga evacuation center natin, di ba, basketball court, ano pa ba, uh, uh, basketball court lang naisip ko, ano pa ba, mga... mga open mga fields di ba yung mga schools pala schools di ba doon yung mga evacuation center and talagang hindi siya uh, built for this requirements but we have to do so the thing that we really have to take note very important during communication that talaga is uh, food safety so the menu for mass feeding are supposed to be dapat simple, easy to cook and serve. Kaya example namin dyan, mga arroz caldo, sopas, yung parang in one, in one cooking, it can, ano, it's jam-packed already with nutrients, vitamins, minerals, um, carbohydrates, fats, proteins, and it actually is acceptable for kinakain ng sopas, mapamatanda, mapabata. No? It's something na can fill up, yung can warm our stomach. So it's high energy high energy drinks are also uh, good kaya lang ang problem sa high energy drink medyo mahal in terms of cost eh remember di ba pag pag ano din pag may mga calamities we also have to consider our limited uh, budget or resources no so milk for children is also very important so i think that's all so i hope you've learned something from our field nutrition in terms of uh, adapting to uh, many climate changes uh, that we encounter emergency disaster so these are the things that we do in our function as nutrition dietitian in adapting during climate changes so thank you very much and back to you sir ron ma'am Ma bailey thank you so much ma'am Doc Amy for that very very interesting talk and on how um concerned ang mga nutri nutritionist natin sa mga uh, na lahat yung mga uh, tao uh, mga Pilipinong na 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 nakakaranas ng mga emergencies and disasters that we always that all of you are ensuring that they get their um important nutrients even though um they are displaced from their normal homes and all that so i'm it was very interesting for you mga um different uh researches that you showed from uh that's coming up from the ost fnri i'm like i would really like that's really something that sana ma uh, mas mabilis ma roll oh, yes ma'am ma roll down <laughs> roll na, ma roll ma roll out actually marami okay. na sila in the past ano sir ron marami na rin sila in the past eh, nung mga 19 late 1980s 90s pero ang ano talaga problem natin a little bit if i'm not mistaken this is my personal view siguro marketing hindi rin siguro ma market di ba meron pa sila dati na parang mga squash noodles Uh, malunggay noodles pero it's really not that popular in the market no mas popular pa yung mga Korean noodles na hindi naman natin mabasa yung label pero we're still buying it din natin alam mo ano yon di ba pero yung mga squash noodles ano i, I think marketing din ang problem natin so siguro yun din po ano so that's a good uh, that's a good point po talaga to make sure yung doon sa research yung mga future researches niyo with the OST na importante malaking malaking words po yung marketing <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much for for, for sharing you. all of that. Yes, uh and Ma Meme has already um uh typed in here in our chat box. If you have any questions po for Ma'am uh from for Doc Amy, you can start typing it in your questions here, but we'll have a um an open forum po at the end. So, thank you so much Ma'am Amy. Thank you. Okay. Let us move on now to uh, hold on for uh, okay. So from nutrition, let's move on naman to ayaw gumalaw. 
Um, so let's uh, continue our uh, webinar with the sad reality nga during uh, disaster events, but it's a very, very important issue. Kaya we had to uh, make sure that's included dito sa webinar natin on how to address uh, and lessen the trauma that um, yung mga disaster victims natin that they have when uh, they lose a loved one during this events. Um, so here to with us today is Prof. Maria Melinda Mendoza, who is an associate professor from the Department of Social Development Services in our college. Uh, disaster and dying during uh, disaster and dying during disaster death, sorry, death and dying during disasters is one of her major areas of interest. And throughout her more than three decades of career as an academic and practitioner, Prof. Mendoza has led national and multi-country multi research on the impacts of climate change and disasters. So, to, so now to talk about how to provide uh, death-related social services across the four thematic areas of DRM, I am proud to call on Ma'am Emmy. Thank you, Ma'am Pat. Oo, talaga may clap talaga si Ma'am Pat. Maraming, maraming salamat po. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, let me uh, just share my screen. Okay. So, um, for this afternoon's uh, webinar, I have been uh, tasked to talk on death and disasters, providing uh, death-related social services across the four themes. No? So, I tweak a little bit the title. Uh, instead of that, I, I, um, I worded it as uh, death-related social services across the DRM uh, spectrum. So, um, let me let me uh, have a disclaimer at this point. No, that uh, this paper really is uh, more reflexive rather than instructive and uh, procedural. But it's also a call to action. Uh, and as Sir Ron had um, mentioned, no, uh, human ecology as a whole is really a call to action. So even if it's reflexive in nature, no, uh, we will end it with a note for uh, action. Okay, so my, my uh, presentation will follow this uh, flow. So we'll have a bit of an introduction by reflecting on uh, the definitions. And uh, there are three basic uh, concepts that uh, we will be, uh, we will try to reflect on and, and uh, define somehow uh, given the uh, limited time that we have. So that will include death, disaster and social services. And then a section on death and disaster and death and disaster, just so we can uh, suit together no? uh, the relationship between death and uh, disaster. And then we'll talk about the uh, disaster risk management uh, spectrum. So uh, we can continue reflecting on how uh, we can uh, incorporate death and uh, deal with death no, within the whole spectrum. And then a section, uh, this one starts the call to action, uh, death as a neglected matter uh, when it comes to DRM. And uh, finally, some uh, concluding uh, statements. Okay, so... Uh, Let's look into some basic definitions. Now, death has always been uh, the, the, the area for uh, the medical sciences. No? And many of the definitions that uh, we, you will find if you try to uh, look into the definition of death would be coming from the uh, medical uh, sciences. No? So uh, in 1981, I got this uh, definition from Bernard uh, Culver and uh, Gert, no? death has been being discussed and debated about in so many ways. Paano nga ba malalaman kung patay na? Ano ba talaga ang kamatayan? No? Uh, but uh, these uh, authors gave a very concise and uh, 
uh, something that you know medical people because these are these are uh, doctors medical doctors uh, would agree that death is really the total and irreversible loss of the functioning of the whole brain of course uh, that settled a lot of uh, debates no, among among uh, the medical uh, uh, practitioners but it also brought a lot of other uh, debates no because now they started talking about uh, whole brain death and uh, how different is that for, is there another type of death aside from whole brain uh, death no so um Youngner and his uh, colleagues no uh, mentioned that uh, they, they argued that death is inevitable but its meaning has never been certain because it continues to be a contingent and evolving concept and it is shaped by the dynamics of medicine um, uh, science, society, as well as uh, culture. Uh, so much so that uh, even at this time, no, 2021 na nagsimula yung ano na, ng, uh, ng discussion about death since time immemorial, uh, death now is seen as a process involving, involving the cessation of uh, physiological functions and the determination of death is the final event in the process. So now, instead of a state uh, some people are saying that it is uh, it should be looked into as a, a process. No, uh, a distinction is now being made between uh, death, however, at the cellular and tissue levels, and death of a person. So, tuloy tuloy pa rin, no, ang kanilang discussion at saka debate. Uh, paano ba talaga define itong phenomenon? No, this phenomenon called uh, death. But what is uh, being made clear, no, given you know all the debates and all the discussions even just for the definition of death, is that death is a medical, it's a social, it's a political, a moral, and even an economic uh, phenomenon. And death is used to define many other phenomena found within uh, human ecosystems. In fact, death statistics are uh, used to forward certain positions, certain advocacies, and certain decisions. Ginagamit pa nga ang uh, death statistics para masabi kung uh, are, are we going to declare uh, uh, a state of uh, a state of calamity, a state of disaster. No, So in short, in many, many ways, death uh, defines life and our uh, life concerns. Okay, so uh, that's that for you. It does not uh, really give us a uh, uh, one definition for death, but uh, just to tell you that uh, it's a debate and it's an ongoing uh, research. No, uh, just to define death. The other, the other concept that uh, we need to define at this time, no, uh, this afternoon is disaster. Okay, uh, Perry had a um, very social science uh, definition of disaster, and she said that as disaster is a social scientific concept that refers to a particular class of phenomena whose specification rests you know, in theory-based uh, thinking. So often, uh, oftentimes, uh, disaster is related to hazards and uh, hazard uh, events, no, and uh, as it is experienced by uh, human ecosystems and within the context, no, of uh, human uh, ecosystems. But even government develop mandated definitions of disaster for purposes of determining the boundaries no, of emergency management, such as, you know, when uh, our governments uh, talk about mitigation, disaster preparedness, response and recovery, which is really uh, the common spectrum, no? And, and uh, in particularly in connection with the distribution of funds and other uh, resources, no? So disasters, it seems, no, uh, go beyond the occurrence of just natural hazards. No? Its definition is not just uh, linked to natural hazards. Indeed, they are linked, but uh, they go beyond that because they are also social, uh, political, and uh, cultural no? in definition. So, the, so here, uh, when related to 
a disaster is uh, the concept of disaster risk. And usually disaster risk is expressed as the likelihood of the loss of life, injury, or destruction and damage from a disaster in a given period of uh, time. No? And uh, the Handbook of Disaster Research uh, argues that disaster risk is uh, really widely recognized as a consequence of the interaction between you know, uh, hazards, exposures, uh, sensitivities, capacities, and uh, people's uh, vulnerabilities. Okay, the third is uh, social services. And uh, offhand, this refers to government services provided for the benefit of communities such as, uh, but not limited to education, medical care, and housing. So usually mga basic uh, needs. No? Uh, but they also, they, they, they include the benefits no? and facilities no? such as uh, food subsidies, uh, healthcare, job training, and uh, subsidized housing, adoption even, uh, community management, uh, policy research, and lobbying. So um, it's a wide range no? of uh, areas of concern when we talk about social uh, services. Even in 1985, no, the World Summit for, uh, 1995 rather, the World Summit for uh, Social Development in that was uh, held in Copenhagen, uh, world leaders agreed that uh, international assistance, when we talk about social services, no, international assistance should be targeted towards the basic social services, which include at the time, primary health care, basic education, clean water, and uh, proper sanitation. That, is, that was 1995. No? Uh, but more recent developments in the provision of social services have incorporated more items, no? more areas of concern, especially even in the area of mental health and general well-being. Okay, so ang coverage po ng uh, social services natin, kung gusto natin ng, uh, uh, within the context of human ecology, no, is that it should be holistic and that means it's across the lifespan. So in other words, we think not just of a specific sector, uh, we think of uh, human development across the, the lifespan. So there are social services that uh, cater more to infants and, and uh, children and there are those that cater to the labor force and there are those that uh, cater to uh, the elderly. No? But as long as uh, people are alive and uh, we want to preserve that as, as long as possible, that's the usual uh, uh, trend. No? Uh, and so even those who are, who are already in the, uh, in, in, in the that space, no, that um, area of dying, no, they are already transitioning to the next life. As long as they are still uh, part of this uh, life, of this world, then uh, they're covered supposedly by our social uh, services. So they're supposed to be inclusive. And so across the social class spectrum, walang sinisino ang social services. Of course, uh, we usually have a bias in favor of uh, those who have nuts, no? yung may mga kakulangan at saka yung mga uh, na discriminate o yung mga na ma-marginalize. Kasi nga, uh, baka wala silang capacities and therefore they government should uh, look into their plight. No? And social services should be comprehensive. Uh, they should cover basic or general needs, but also they should cover emerging needs and uh, circumstances. They're supposed to be implemented in humane uh, manner, and they're supposed to be at the very basic compliant to human rights, including the right to social justice and uh, the right to human uh, security. And you know, uh, I uh, there's a new book just came out in uh, this year 2021 where the authors um, were uh, say, stating you know, they were claiming that you know the the most basic definition of human security is uh, the absence of fear and uh, this brings me to you know the whole issue and concern about death because what really started my uh, my 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 interest in death was really the question of why is it that some people are not afraid of death 
on the other hand, uh, we meet a lot of people who do not even want to talk about death. They do not want to have it in a discussion. They don't want to think about it because uh, maybe because they are afraid of uh, death. So uh, this is something that really uh, got my attention. And uh, it 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 went on, you know, that attention went on when I uh, came across uh, economically uh, challenged community you know, in Davao de Oro and where people were, uh, were actually not afraid you know, of uh, dealing with the phenomenon of death in their daily lives. In fact, ang kwento nila sa akin nga is that, uh, you know, every day they, they, they think about how they can work together to prepare for death within the community, no? Because uh, it's an um, economic challenge no? to, to, to die, no? It's an economic challenge to, uh, to the family who's, uh, who will be remaining. So they, they organize themselves in such a way na, alimbawa, sa uh, pag uh, pag uh, anong tawag yan? the wake no the uh, yung pag uh, nag naglalamay uh, meron na silang uh, meron na silang kitchen crew oh ayan para hindi na bang po problema ang mga namatayan paano papakainin yung mga dapat pakainin at mga nakikiramay so may kitchen crew sila meron din silang lapida crew no para hindi na mamo problema yung mga uh, mga families na pati lapida ay hahanapin pa nila o bibilhin pa nila o papagawa pa nila. So doon sa kanilang community, meron na rin gagawa. So meron na silang mga komo na kaldero, komo na malalaking kawa at malalaking sandok para, you know, uh, everything is covered so that the family, no, the family uh, where death was experienced or ex experienced, no, has a lot of uh, really community uh, community support. Okay, so in lahat, you know, people are not equal when it comes to uh, not wanting you know, to talk about death because some are scared, some are uh, afraid, some do not want to think about it, uh, but some do, you know, even in um, even in rural, urban communities. Okay, so let me go to death in disaster and death and disaster just to sue them uh, together. And this is coming from uh, some bit. Some, uh, very basic uh, data from uh, MDAT, no? And uh, just to uh, see, just to show rather, that uh, death is uh, really incorporated all the time with uh, disasters. If you go to MDAT, no? There's a lot of data about uh, disaster all over uh, the world. And I was looking, I am actually looking at uh, death and disaster uh, within uh, 71 uh year period no, from the 1950s to uh to 2021 and uh, i saw that uh these are the top five disasters for the philippines okay and uh in terms of uh, many other uh uh indicators but including the indicator of uh, casualties and deaths. No? So nakikita natin, and many of you know that uh, one of the more memorable and tragic uh, disasters that uh, we experienced as a nation was uh, Yolanda, which uh, still has the highest uh, number of deaths no, since the 1950s, no, uh, one-time uh, disaster. Okay, uh, and following that was um, uh, an earthquake in 1976. Okay, we're talking about disaster here, not just uh, not just uh, 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 hydrometeorological uh, events, no, uh, which was really um, an earthquake, no, that struck. Uh, the Sulu Tawitawi area, where uh, the reported deaths at that time, no, was uh, up to six thousand, and you know, usually these are even underreported. You no, know, this this kind of statistics are underreported because um, that earthquake came with a tsunami, you no, know, uh, in the area, and then uh, the third is uh, a tropical cyclone, also, you no, know, uh, Telma. And uh, the 1990 event of uh, Baguio, 
and uh, the fifth is uh, BOPA, no? PS BOPA, uh, which uh, struck uh, in 2012 no? uh, the uh, Eastern Board no? of uh, uh, Davao uh, Oriental. Okay. So, uh, what I want to uh, show here is that uh, when we're talking about uh, disasters, one of the defining uh, factors no, of disasters are casualties and deaths. No? And uh, whether we like it or not, they're usually intertwined. It's not very disastrous when you do not have deaths. And so uh, I don't know how we can really talk of a disaster without a casualty. Okay, so uh, the Philippines has always been, we, we know this uh, very well, the Philippines has always been uh, one of the most vulnerable uh, countries, no? and in 2020, uh, we're still topping together with some other countries, although Indonesia was, you know, uh, the top uh, during that uh, period as a country with the most number of disasters, okay? And uh, this one shows uh, the World Risk uh, Index, and though... Uh, the Philippines in 2020 ranks uh, nine, I think. No, uh, there was a time that uh, we even was uh, second, no, of the most uh, vulnerable countries as far as hydrometeorological uh, events, no, are uh, concerned. Okay. Um, Amy, we so, need to ask you to um, wrap up na po. Okay, sige. So this is our uh, DRM uh, spectrum. And uh, we see here that uh, the spectrum uh, really includes preparedness, response, rehab, and uh, mitigation. Okay, And we have some questions here. But let me bring, because I'm being asked to uh, wrap up uh, already. Okay, Let me go to death as a neglected uh, matter. Okay. And uh, when we're talking about the spectrum no, of uh, DRM, when we talk about mitigation, for instance, where are our death-related services? Where are our cemeteries? Are they enough? Where is our crematorium? No? In preparedness, how do we prepare? No? Uh, how prepared are we? And uh, are we prepared to respond to extreme events and the likelihood of disasters? What about death management? Are, are they in our plan? Are they in our uh, scoreboards, no? scorecards rather? Uh, uh, we're talking management of death and uh, the missing, uh, but this should include uh, mobility plans as well as mobility routes. No, What about grief and bereavement uh, services? Uh, when we're talking about uh, response, again, we're talking about uh, are we giving not just a basic food and clothing, but also assistance to uh, the loss of lives? And what about uh, families who are, you know, lost? Wala na ngang makain, but they're also grieving and uh, they're bereaved you know, because of uh, the loss of loved ones. And for recovery and rehabilitation, I guess uh, we should ask ourselves and reflect what is the coverage of our rehab to build back uh, uh, better? No? How are communities preparing for deaths and disasters? And uh, how prepared are we for the next encounter with mass, de mass, mass deaths, no? as well as protracted events where death is imminent like COVID-19? Uh, okay, so as for conclusion, uh, let me just uh, uh, mention this. How we respond to issues impinging on human ecosystems is largely a function of our definitions and foci. And so we tend to neglect aspects of how we can mitigate, prepare for, respond to, and recover from disasters when we fail to surface them in our collective consciousness. So it is imperative to my mind to talk, to discourse, to plan, and act on death in the context of disaster risk management. And we have to maximize the utility of a human ecological perspective in culturally appropriate and inclusive DRM. So let's start uh, thinking and talking with the end and in mind. And the next time we reflect on our human ecological uh, framework, uh, on what else can be done given the breadth and depth of DRM, let's not neglect that death is part of life, no? And to mainstream death and dying, no? We need to do a lot of uh, academic work, including conducting research on death and dying uh, issues. I read somewhere that the best way to prepare for death is to live life to the fullest. But uh, let me add to that also that the best way to live life no, is to prepare, prepare for death. With that, thank you. 
Thank you very much po, Ma'am Emmy. Sorry we had to cut you for no that. No problem. But, yeah, yeah, no opo, problem. But the questions that you actually posed in those uh, last few slides were very interesting and something that um, is good for the students to make sure that they also have that thing in consideration if not only while we're, we're in their class, pag nasa profession na nila, um, when we're discussing CAA and DRR, kailangan rin natin umabot dun sa aspect na yun to make sure that we also uh, consider how we're going to uh, handle and uh, make sure na bibigyan natin ng support uh, yung, mga, um, yung mga tao na nakawalan ng mga uh, mamahal nila sa buhay. Thank you so much. It was very, very interesting to ma'am. Okay, thank you. As we move on, so yes, a quick clap clap for Ma'am Emmy. Uh, as we move on po, sa next talk natin, we will be um, uh, given a talk by one of our distinguished alumni from this SERP and from CHE. Uh, Sir Ben Agihon is an urban planner and he's currently working as a city coordinator of UN Habitat Philippines. His planning practice focuses on mainstreaming sustainability to spatial and development planning, increasing community participation planning in planning processes, and promoting natural and nature-based design so nature-based design solutions in urban infrastructure projects. He is now working on projects that optimize risk assessment methods to inform COVID-19 socioeconomic recovery and climate resilience planning and the localization of uh, city plans and actions to reduce marine litter. So to share uh, the work that he has been doing on building back smarter communities, um, please welcome ENP Ben Agihon. Sir Ben? Thank you, Ma'am Patch. Good, uh, good afternoon po. Thank you, Sir Jay. Sir Ron, um, very interesting discussion coming from Doc Amy and Prof. Uh, Amy. Uh, truly, no, na, na yung extent ng life from feeding to death uh, very important. And uh, for my input, I will try to uh, uh, contextualize the climate change impacts and planning uh, of the consequent disasters, uh, considering then yung current situation natin ngayon with the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you, Ma'am Emmy, for actually setting the tone of my of my uh, input for this afternoon. Uh, these materials are part of the Building Climate Resiliency to Urban Plans and Designs Project uh, implemented by the UN Habitat together with the HSUD and the uh, City of Ermok. Uh, for my presentation, we'll be navigating five points, Ermok City, uh, climate change, pandemic, and development considerations, its, di its dynamics. Uh, yung context ng resilient and green recovery, ito po yung binabanggit natin na building back better. I will try to uh, guide, uh, to navigate yung process namin dito in terms of the project. Some examples of the project outputs in terms of the urban designs and some uh, key takeaways. Uh, for our key city, uh, Ormo is a regional hub in the Eastern Desires region and this is an agro-commercial center for renewable and energy. Uh, capital, ito yung tina-target nila na vision. And as you know, uh, palagi ito ring nadadaanan ng bagyo as uh, every year, no? As as mentioned actually from the presentation of Doc Emmy, uh, Typhoon Yolanda and Typhoon uh, Telma Uring in 1991 uh, nag-traverse dito sa area ng Ormoc City. This is now a uh, 41% urbanized and uh, with a population of around 230,000. Uh, from uh, on in terms of its spatial strategy, multinodal yung mode of development in the city still anchored dun sa city center nila as the uh, major node of development and taking advantage of the existing uh, facilities and uh, conurbations and uh, urban sprawls para magbuo ng separate urban nodes on those areas. In terms of urban areas, urban land, uh, 
the built area of the city uh, from the total 46,000 hectares, around 8.32% lang dyan yung built area, of which uh, my special mention lang ako on urban spaces uh, within uh, 0.24%. So in terms of climate change and pandemic and development consideration, as I've mentioned earlier, uh, sana naririg nyo pa ako, it started raining here in my area. Uh, there are 71 villages uh, with flood degrees and around 150,000 uh, people yung maapektuhan nito. And uh, an estimate of around 1.3 billion may be lost uh, from extreme events by 2030 if the uh, impact of uh, flooding will not be um, mitigated. In terms of temperature, uh, in terms of climate change, there will be an expected increase of 8.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, there will be expected increase of 2.0 degrees Celsius under the 8.5 scenario. And uh, this development uh, will provide a hotter temperature in the urban area, especially now na nagsa start yung uh, increasing uh, urbanization with the investments coming from the housing and the commercial uh, sector. In terms of greenhouse gas emission, uh, they have 155, 151,000 tons of carbon dioxide uh, equivalent as of 2017 inventory. And these uh, come from 64% uh, coming from the agriculture, waste, and industry sectors, while 36% uh, comes from the electricity use. So definitely this is this is highly contributed by the urban actions uh, that we deliver in our homes and our offices uh, with the use of that requires the use of uh, electricity. This is the citywide risk assessment. As you can see across Ormoc, uh, uh, they have specific uh, hazard and eventually specific disaster that is about to happen. In the West area, which their agriculture area is, it is, uh, it is at risk to flooding, while their urban center and coastal areas where there are uh, a lot of human settlements, it is uh, uh, at risk to urban heat and flooding, while the upland and the forest area are also at risk to landslide. And this also, uh, Armok City is situated in an active uh, area of volcanology, they they experience around uh, they experience a, a great impact of uh, earthquake last 2017 that affected upland uh, settlements. In terms of the current pandemic, uh, we can see that 63% of the cases are still within the urban area, which displays around 15,000 and a half uh, uh, workers and uh, about. 438 businesses decided to close. Uh, on the other end of this, 25% of the households still not have the direct access to water at home when we need uh, water for our uh, sanitation. And informal settlers are still uh, living on their destitute houses and there are about 3,147 families na walang uh, adequate housing for their uh, isolation and uh, quarantines. And these are on top of the climate hazards that is affecting the city, uh, including flooding and uh, urban heat. These are just some uh, key uh, issues, top line results of an impact study developed uh, with Tampe uh, to, to assess the impact of COVID-19 to the urban poor and to link it with, uh, with, uh, with the action requirements in designing the city. Number one, we can see that there is inaccessibility of health services aside from the low health seeking behavior now, not only uh, discussing displacement, uh, but also uh, house, rising household debts. The shift on mode of delivery, not only in education, but also on other uh, social services, and the inaccessibility to food and formation of unhealthy responses, as, as, as we can see from uh, Doc Barion's presentation, and some limitations on mobility, not only on health concern, but also on the cost required, no? tumaas din yung fare, tumaas din yung bayad natin when we want to uh, travel. 
But uh, what is also good here, what is noticeable also here is there is a high level of uh, knowledge and under awareness basically on how we can prevent uh, the spread of COVID-19. That's hand washing practice, the access to clean water, and the providing spaces for our physical distancing. Um, in two uh, major issues, uh, we look on housing conditions at least and on public and open spaces. We can see that 25% uh, of those uh, people uh, residing on in Ormoc uh, have threats in eviction. And uh, there is a growing number of informal settlers, especially after the Yolanda, after Yolanda happened, and they are now living along river banks. And in terms of open spaces, public and open spaces, these are your roads, your uh, parks, your markets. 85% of the surveyed urban poor mentioned that there is, uh, uh, there is a need for open spaces for them to uh, for travel and to access their basic uh, necessities. But of course, there is the constant uh, consideration of climate hazards and its eventual disasters like flood and uh, storm surges. Looking on the interface of uh, climate change impacts and the COVID-19 pandemic, we can look on three uh, entry points in doing our recovery work and our development planning work. Number one is the improvement of basic services. We can look on sustainable water management. We can look on affordable housing and improving internet connectivity. In terms of public spaces optimization, there is a need to establish resilient and sustainable street networks and to utilize the network of open spaces for our COVID-19 responses and recovery. And of course, in any disaster, there's always impact on the economic. So there also the rise of sustainable business models that we can see with our current situation does require us to improve the virtual spaces for our businesses, providing incentives for our businesses with uh, green approaches, and to design smart and resilient approaches, particularly with the private uh, sector. Uh, I think you, everyone is familiar with this uh, caricature or this uh, editorial cartoon. And there's a story about it. There is a progression of how people view the COVID-19 and how it happened to be connected to climate change later on in a continuum of uh, problems that we are facing now. So COVID-19 pandemic exacerbates the long-term uh, concerns of economic stability and uh, climate change. However, in, in the country, uh, we are always aware that uh, COVID-19 is not only the problem. There's always disaster, there's always typhoon, there will be fires, there will be, uh, there will be uh, earthquakes that can happen anytime. Thus, there is always a, a, a framework of, uh, of addressing problems in totality, no? considering all those hazards available to us or happening to us. So how are we doing the uh, response on this or planning on this? We, we, are, we, are, we have what we call a response recovery sustainable development continuum, which in a crisis in general, we, we we define it as an act or a process of returning to normal state. It involves a wide range of multidimensional planning. I think uh, this is what has been emphasized by Ron a while ago on transdisciplinary approaches. It is phased, so there is a midget, short term, uh, medium, long term uh, initiatives and goals. And it is more than returning to your pre disaster context, it's even going beyond, if possible. On your, uh, the, on your sustainable development goals. And this requires major decisions and to be made under good governance. So 
So situating it in a uh, continuum, uh, we can uh, we can position the recovery work, let's say in our current situation now, from the start of 2020 up to the current, where new realities, uh, pandemic restrictions, new methods slowing down, uh, added to the existing hazards of climate change and COVID-19. And when we say uh, planning continuum in terms of recovery, it is about to set the tone on your return or your uh, uh, return to the sustainable development goals of the uh, city. Overall, there are uh, six uh, rehabilitation guiding principles that we are uh, providing in, in all recovery work. Number one is it building back better and safer. It looks on exposure to these would be to a level that is less than before. Action that shall address the vulnerabilities and risks, promoting the RRM and resilience building. There is a mention of disaster risk assessment a while ago, and that is the tool that we can use in addressing our specific vulnerabilities and risks. It should be inclusive and holistic. There will be no uh, person and no place behind. Multiple resource generation and financial resources should be achieved in uh, making a broad base of impacts and stakeholders. The need to, it should be needs-based and results-oriented. The use of emergency responses as uh, building blocks. So when you plan your, when you do, your response and recovery work, it should be building block to your uh, development goals in the city. And it should be collaborative, multi-sector, and participatory. I'm also floating the uh, concern of uh, systems model as also coming from our framework. There are uh, uh, five, uh, five uh, thematic areas in system models. We can look on organization from individual to national or to the state. We have the spatial elements from your plot to blocks to your uh, to, to the country. And there is functional elements when we look on planning, public works, revenue systems, and management. And we also look on the physical elements, looking on your public facilities, up to your uh, services and your housing. And of course, the element of time that should always be considered when you do your recovery planning. So the, these are some entry points in mainstreaming your post-crisis strategies and actions within the current uh, planning system in the country. Your uh, typical planning base is uh, your ecological profile and sectoral studies. At minsan tawag natin dito, situational analysis. And when you do your uh, visioning, there is also, that's also an opportunity for us to mainstream uh, crisis or post-disaster post uh, development goals. When you do your goals and objectives, strategic pathways, and your, of course, implementation in developing your programs, projects, and activities. Activities. I'm just floating this particular uh, reference. Uh, last year, we uh, produce, uh, we released a guide on integrating health to spatial planning that looks on five uh, concerns. That's compact places, that's socially inclusive places, better connected places, resilient and climate change and natural hazards and institutionally integrated management. These are also some uh, learning resources from UN Habitat. You can look on this in our website. When, when we talk of uh, disaster, when we talk of recovery, at the end of the day, what we are looking for is resilience, which is the ability of a system or a community or a society exposed to hazards to resist, absorb, accommodate, and adopt to transform and recover from the effects of, its, of this hazard in a timely and efficient manner 
including the preservation and restoration of essential basic structures and function through risk management. That's why risk assessment is very important because that's the basic that's the basis of your uh, decisions on how are you going to return or restore your basic services and structures. When we say uh, resist, it is, it is the ability for us to withstand the negative impacts of the hazards. I, hindi niya to tinatanggap, ibinabalik niya lang ito, let's say flood, your, uh, your flood resistant engineering, uh, binabalik nila, nila yung water. It, you can also absorb it. You can take, let's say, the water to be absorbed by your pipes or by your underground, uh, your underground aquifers or your uh, storage. It can also be accommodated if you can assess how much the vol yung volume ng flood na papasok, pwede mong i-design yung parks or yung bahay mo na pwede siyang mag-steady uh, for a while, then tsaka siya babalik sa natural, uh, natural streams. And of course, yung recovery, hindi pag nasira, kailangan ibalik dun sa dati niyang uh, status or mas higit pa dun sa pangangailangan, sa, sa new na mga pangangailangan na inilalabas noong uh, hazard. And adopt to, you can uh, design your buildings or your roads that the flood can just pass through in a matter of, let's say, an hour or uh, 30 minutes. It depends on your, uh, on your goal. Of, uh, of how and when you want to resume a uh, normalcy after the uh, after a disaster after, or after a typhoon and transform. I think this is the main challenge uh, for every city and every communities in the country because this requires a large amount of investment in uh, in putting in new technology and redesigning everything in our uh, in our cities. In our project, uh, we are sponsoring the idea of green recovery. Or Ben, excuse me, can you summarize na po ng konti? Yes, I'll try. Yes, I'll try. Uh, give me three okay. minutes. Sorry, sorry. Uh, this green, uh, green recovery, which is aligning back to uh, your uh, long-term uh, climate change and sustainability goals. So I'm just flashing some photos uh, from Ormok City. This is how we do uh, the process or uh, we, 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 uh, we undergo or we underwent uh, resilient and green recovery planning. And these are some uh, projects that we have on different sectors. And another session on mentoring is specific urban planning and design. So I'm just flashing some outputs from these workshops. This is how you can redesign your built environment that adopt that uh, addresses adaptation and mitigation of climate change there's a uh, building design with arcades trees and benches uh, water collection discharge and uh, collection deployment of market on wheels bike lanes um, and uh, cooling and better ventilation for your buildings in terms of your roads, uh, you can put in, uh, of, again, trees and uh, open air services. Ilapit natin yung uh, tindahan, yung kainan sa mga, sa mga kalsada. And of course, support a safe public mobility. In terms of water waterfronts, no, madaming cities sa atin sa bansa sa Pilipinas is facing the coast. So we can uh, introduce mangrove rehabilitation and uh, providing that linear space, linear park, that, uh, that buffer zone uh, from, the, from the coast. So para that particular distance na binibigay agad natin from the coast to the settlements or any infrastructure, it's a built environment mo, that's already a part of your adaptation measures. And these are just some examples on how you can uh, uh, add, uh, there's, how you can make uh, your built area pandemic responsive. Again, and this is, uh, I think this is the mention on how we're going to include the community, the people in our work. No? So these are just uh, examples 
from a the community workshop on urban design at Barangay Can Adyeng. This is one of our workshops. This is the situation on the ground. Uh, this area is particularly at risk to storm surge and flooding. And there is a there's a group of uh, informal settlers here. And this is the situation in the city on the ground. And this is our design. No? Uh, there is uh, the social housing component. There is a waterfront component and uh, a lot of trees and a lot of water uh, pathways in the built environment mismo. Hindi lang doon sa, uh, sa, sa river, hindi lang doon sa sea, but also within the built environment, meaning your roads, your, uh, your canals, and even within the housing units. And these uh, add on to their climate and development objectives. As we have mentioned, this can be mainstreamed not only on the project development, but more on the uh, project conceptualization on the objective setting. And these are some resilience, economic and development benefits. So there you can uh, save people from flooding. You can have annual savings for the city. You can use uh, uh, water that you can collect as another resource and that can decrease temperature uh, within your community. It also helps in decreasing uh, uh, CO2 emissions, additional uh, vegetation area in the city, and rationalization of your path, of your walkability in the city. And of course, uh, in any project that we do, uh, as much as possible, uh, there should be a housing component on it that uh, that is part of our mission as a, as an organization. Uh, hopefully, I, I, I got some uh, messages across, but just to uh, emphasize five points, uh, we have to situate uh, recovery planning in a planning continuum. And once we do, uh, or once we, uh, once we put it on that continuum, we should put also the climate and health as an it put, meaning a consideration and an outcome of planning. And there should be an integration of each truth and solution as a process that can help us also a mainstream uh, investments on those projects. If that project can solve a multiple uh, uh, problems and issues problem uh, at, in an area that is a very good project. And there must be uh, emphasis on the vulnerable poor. I have mentioned of uh, in, informal settler families and even your uh, Daily, daily workers that has been affected by by the by the problem, kailangan magkaroon tayo ng tailor fit problem, uh, tailor tailor fit program to them, and we can experiment in maximizing your open spaces because that is uh that's an attempt to equalize the uneven and differentiated impacts of flood of storm surge, and now COVID nineteen, and if you want to develop project, it should be on a neighborhood scale. Sa atin, every now and then, lagi tayong bumababa sa barangay. We are aware that uh, an impact can 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 gen can be generated in a neighborhood scale. And hopefully, you got the process of resilient and green recovery. This can be tested not only or in our mock but across uh, different uh, cities and settings in the community, in the in the country. Uh, the learnings from this uh, project uh, will be developed. Uh, together with the Department of Human Settlements and Urban Design and Urban Development, which we will be uh, uh, releasing maybe early next year as a guide to all local government units and planning uh, practitioners in how are we going to mainstream resilient and green recovery in our uh, planning work. Uh, that's from my end. Over to you, Ma'am Patch. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Ben, for that um, comprehensive uh, lecture on how we can actually mainstream mga crisis strategies exactly san tayo uh, pwede tumulong sa mga LGU uh, on how to not just go back to you know, after any disaster or even COVID. Sana hindi nga tayo babalik lang dun sa normal, mag-transform tayo oh, and um, Make sure that we're more prepared and we're we're take that we're be more more conscious of um that we are well adapted to whatever uh, disaster may come our way. 
Okay. Yes. And for our, hold on, let me check on my list. Uh, and uh, last but not the least, our reactor for today is one of our collaborators from the Eastern Samar State University. Dr. Bless Badok is a disaster risk management scholar who recently obtained her PhD in commerce from the University of Santo Tomas. And Dr. Bless is also a survivor of the Typhoon Haiyan, which she will highlight in her reaction to to this to the um, four talks uh, given previously. Please welcome uh, Dr. Bless Badok. Thank you, ma'am. I hope I am clear. Yes, ma'am, we can hear you. Sorry. Okay, um, uh, so I will just uh, share my screen. Is it still red? Oh. Uh, we're still waiting for it to show. Antay lang. <gasps> oh, no. Yeah, my internet is quite... Opo. Oh, uh, alam ko po. Nakapunta na po ako sa G1. So, <laughs> familiar po. But, <laughs> ang ganda-ganda po dyan. So, ingit po ako actually right now. <laughs> I hope my PowerPoint is already showing. Is it? Yes po. It's showing na ma'am. Doc bless. Okay, so um, as a reaction to to the topic of Sir Ron, uh, it was like a walk through the role of human ecology and transdisciplinary approaches and system approaches towards providing solution to climate change adaptation and DRM. Um, being one of the survivors of Typhoon Newland, the, the presentation was indeed an eye opener for me, and um. It shows that a multidisciplinary appro approach to wicked problems born out of the VUCA era or the vulnerable, uncertain, complex um, era is not enough. In fact, it's just quite scra scratching the surface of the problem. And we need a advanced approach, and it's the trans transdisciplinary approach, uh, supplemented, of course, with the systems approaches. And it is a necessity so that we can get through the core of the problem being solved. And also, the mood of survival should emanate from the various spheres of disciplinary, um, various discipline with the strong involvement of stakeholders and the survivors themselves as owners of the experience and who are more likely to be propelled to move forward um, with better strategies and more sustainable actions. So um, that was quite... Uh, uh, here, uh, with, the, with the nutrition in terms of... Um, in emergencies by Dr. Amy Sherry. Um, this biscuit reminded me <laughs> during the Yolanda days. It uh, during the first few weeks, it made us survive, and also it was important for for us to have accessibility to water without being dependent to electricity. So the jetmatic pumps and open wells were very much important during that time. I hope so that with the with the Green recovery, green re resilient of urban communities, where uh, smarter communities will will be able to highlight this as well. Um, also, uh, with the with the presentation, uh, it showed yeah, it 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 somehow um, allowed me to see rural areas rich in sources of raw materials. We have. We have the swamp tar or the crops and everything. And this can be used for processing so that it can, it can become raw materials for ready to eat food products, like the one shown in the presentation um, funded by DOST um, with candy bars, uh, with malungay mix and others so that it can be produced as a substitute to the USAID energy biscuits uh, that the United States provided us during Yolanda. Um, this locally made ready to eat food products will not only maximize the potentials of Philippine agricultural produce, but this can also give birth to social enterprises from the communities as food processors. Of course, with the supervision of our nutrition scientists, so that um, product quality and nutrition and food security issues um, will be properly addressed. Also, um, with the death clusters in Melinda, Mendoza, um, it, it has shown um, the importance of comprehensive and all-inclusive social services. Um, 
with the presence ideally felt starting from prevention of disaster to disaster preparedness the proper response and rehabilitation and recovery also um, there should be an adequate preparation that some uh, because adequate preparation rather um, somewhat provides a cushion to to the shocks of disaster survivors if death is inevitable like I mean, after yolanda i i i always thought that um what doesn't kill you makes us stronger but then again with ample preparation uh it is still uh, important uh, that this preparation should be done before, during, and after disasters so that it can ease towards uh, moving forward through death-related social services. Um, in fact, um, uh, during my dissertation in an interview with our DRM officers, death, ma death management is already included in the scope of the RM in Tacloban City. Before it was, they were just response um, in, their in their management of disaster. And lastly, um, with Mr. Ben, uh, community resilience strengthened by building back smarter communities. It because um, smarter communities somehow decreases the vulnerability of vulnerable populations. Also, transdisciplinary approach is very much relevant in in building smarter communities. Ideally, encompassing areas on policy and governance, economic performance, investment, employment, and human capital, um, social inclusion, poverty reduction, and um the sustainability of cultural and natural environment so i i borrowed this from the unwto also resilient green recovery approach considers all this should be inclusive and holistic and ideally will benefit post disaster communities by strengthening their resilience and eventually all of this should pave the way for sustainability and future survival i love the 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 combination of the topics in this webinar it's somehow it's like a puzzle falling into place and we ended up with sustainability. Thank you. Stop sharing. Thank you so much for that, Doc Bless. And uh, it's nice to see that we were actually able to touch um, things that you actually experience uh during uh, a very difficult time i'm sure when when yolanda passed by and thank you so much Paul, for your time and as we will uh, as we continue now uh a 10 minute we'll have a 10 minute uh q a hold on uh which uh i will now turn over the webinar to Professor uh, Chris Malena to facilitate the open forum. Ma'am Chris. Thank you very much, Ma'am Patch. Um, really, it is uh, enriching as well as heartwarming um, webinar for each one of us. Uh, I believe that we were able to reflect and also we were able to think and sit back and just look at how the different sectors are working together and hopefully in harmonious and that we have uh, seen the presenters uh, give interesting as well as comprehensive uh, presentations on the contemporary concerns and issues in a holistic manner. And I would also want to commend uh, Dr. Bless Gonzalez for such a beautiful way of reaction to the presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Mom. Your insights are really top-notch and um, very useful for each one of us. So right now, we want to hear from you, our dear students, from your um, learnings, from your questions, from your clarifications, and even your reactions. So the chat box is just here you can type in your questions let us know and um let us utilize the time because uh, this is our chance to ask and learn more from the experts in these various fields so earlier there were questions already pitched in to us and uh, simulan ko na po para mas ma maximize natin ang ating um, open forum so the first question uh, came from one of our professors, uh, Dr. Jennifer 
Marie Amparo. And this is addressed to all of the speakers. The question is, how do you envision a world post-COVID in your field of expertise as we continue to address climate change and disaster risk? So again, po, um, how do you envision a world post-COVID in your field of expertise as we address climate change and disaster risk? Um, by start na siguro ako. Sige ma'am. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Amy. Aha. Uh -huh. Siguro ma'am, ano, that's a very ano no, very as much as it's very interesting parang pang Miss Universe yung tanong. Kaya ako na siguro Sir Ron at saka Sir Ben, ano, parang pang beauty contest yung tanong eh. Anyway, um actually after the COVID nga no, I, I think in terms of our field in nutrition Many people nowadays are very health conscious, no? Medyo uh, talagang nag, nag perk up yung yung interest in terms of nutrition, good health kasi nga you have to build your ano eh, your immunity, walang gamot sa COVID eh. So laging ang bukang bibig ng mga tao is more on a uh, building your uh, your immunity. So really much interest talaga yung ano nag surge in terms of uh, good health, a uh, uh, better eating habits. So I, I I expect in the coming years yung uh, the aftermath of pandemic, many people will really be health conscious and in terms of um, in terms of uh a diet they be they will be more on the plant based diet at saka maybe also uh favoring the local ones the the ones which are actually more more accessible what is locally available more indigenous kasi nagkaroon din tayo ng problem uh, during lockdown say eh. uh, uh, talaga yung access nagkaroon ng problem and nowadays we, we see na ah oh, we so we have so many resources pa pala to tap in our own places in our own community so maybe those two ma'am uh, much interest uh, more on ano on uh, health and nutrition good eating habits and then favoring what is locally available more on the plant based diet looking also they, they many people also became conscious of yung mga uh, being resilient uh, yung mga concept of uh, sustainability things like that because during pandemic and daming mga webinars on this eh. so i think especially among the young people so siguro medyo na uh, slowly slowly but surely na inculcate yung yung essence or concepts of resilience and sustainability and part of that is yung sa diet yung intake and nowadays we promote yung mga plant based diet and yun in the future i think medyo magiging popular yon and many people will uh, really take care of their health and be conscious in terms of their food intake Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much po for the comprehensive answer, Doc Amy. Uh, Natouch mo nga, ma'am, no? Yung mga relationships after na magkaroon ng change in the lifestyle ay magkakaroon din po ng opportunities for um, communities to change also in terms of the services that they can offer and at the same time for the industries within these communities to thrive and prosper because of the demand uh, and also because of the change in the paradigm. So we want to learn and hear more also. Salamat po, Doc Amy, from our speakers, um, Prof. Amy, Sir Ben, Sir Ron. Ma'am, can I go next? Sure po. Thank you very okay. much. So, uh, ako naman, ma'am, uh, post-COVID, I what I envision is that uh, there would be uh, sustained no and uh, more critical uh, engagements and and uh, looking into our definitions of disaster because uh, right now uh, we when we talk about disaster risk management uh, oftentimes we just uh, relate them or equate them with uh, all the things that are happening within the uh, climate change uh, arena. No, so uh, but climate change is also so big and super wicked. No, that uh, nakpakita nga ni Sir Ben kanina na eventually, you know, even our concerns about biodiversity and about this COVID thing, these are just uh, parang 
uh, introduction to many many other big super wicked uh, issues no and concerns that uh, we're going to uh, face in the near future but i guess uh, what covid-19 and the lockdown and the, the so called pandemic has uh, uh, taught us no uh, is that um, we have to be very critical about uh, a lot of things including uh, information that uh, you know how to weigh information and also uh, to see you know critically see that there are a lot of information that are usually uh, this discriminated against they are uh, kumbaga, they are marginalized no so how do we uh, put them out so that uh, they they cease to be marginalized no and uh, they become uh, arenas no of uh, very fruitful and productive uh, um, discussion so that uh, we can talk about uh, about a lot of things no and come up with a lot of uh, solutions for this week problem so ang tingin ko dito ma'am after uh, covid there will be still a lot of debates and hopefully these are sustained and productive uh, uh, debates and then uh, also we will be rethinking as far as i'm uh, my my concern is concerned no <laughs> death and dying uh, we will be uh, we will be rethinking about a lot of things in terms of uh, providing services and how to really respond no, to, to a lot of things when it comes to disaster. Kasi ma'am, ang, ang dami talagang kulang ngayon lumalabas, ang daming kulang na mga services at saka mga interventions. Many of these interventions we have not thought about, kaya pe, meron tayong oo nga no, may mga ganun tayo and uh, unless we talk about these things, unless we talk about death and dying for instance no, we will not be able to mainstream this no in uh, DRM and even in climate change uh, uh, adaptation. So yun po, uh, yun ang nakikita ko magkakaroon ng maraming discussion at saka mga sustained uh, discussion so that uh, we can uh, co-create, we can collaborate, we can uh, be constant in our uh, discourses towards a collective uh, consciousness of how to deal with uh, the things that are still going to happen. Thank you Thank very you. much for the comprehensive answer, ma'am. We cannot put it in any way as perfectly as you did. So we will continue now uh, with the open forum by hearing it out from Sir Ben. Thank you, Pa. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I agree with ma'am with Prof. Emmy. Uh, yung pandemic ngayon, uh, pinakita niya yung, yung symptoms ng, let's say on our field, of bad planning, of bad human settlements planning. Uh, it, uh, let's say, uh, we applaud, of course, those uh, community pantries, but that's actually a criticism of how food is not available in every, in every communities. And that's a discourse now of, let's say, sa, sa atin sa, sa human nutrition of how we're going to how community nutrition or the yung, uh, uh, urban urban or urban gardening na may for food security is now being practiced no so yung, yung ganitong these are guide these are guidance na binigay sa atin way before but it's not practiced and it's not uh, implemented no kaya nakikita natin ngayon na validate ngayon on on this on these times yung paano tayo dapat nagpaplano ng komunidad ng kahit ng sidewalk o kahit ng parks o kahit ng bahay na meron sana kahit maliit na na area for uh, urban gardening that's because that will ensure at least that you have a food to eat in in any cases na hindi ka makabili o wala kang pambili nga sa panahon natin ngayon at sa panahon din ng disaster ganun din siya no sa panahon ng natural disasters ganun din siya as compared ngayon na ang nagkaroon sa, sa pandemya na ngayon hindi ka makalabas hindi ka makabili wala kang trabaho so o yung yung ganitong kawalan ng ganitong provision ng kawalan ng ganitong program sa communities is because hindi ito na implement so i think uh, tama i agree magkakaroon ng discussions and i think uh, with our project we're we're trying to start it no especially with the, the with the department of human settlements and urban development hopefully when the material on uh, 
resilient uh, resilient human settlements framework and the COVID-19 agenda uh, will be released soon or uh, will be released by next year. Uh, sana ma, sana na capture niya lahat noong kailangan ng LGUs and communities. At uh, hopefully po ma-engage din namin yung College of Human Ecology in commenting on it. Uh, salamat po. Thank you very much po for your answers, uh, Sir Ben, and at the same time for providing examples also. At, at para mas mapakita kung paano ang connections among various sectors when it comes to dealing with climate change, hazards, um, and disaster risk. And at the same time po, salamat din sa pagtatahi uh, ng mga kasagutan mula sa nutrition, sa social uh, services and social technology and papunta po sa planning. As you mentioned, planning as a continuum in order to uh, promote resilient communities. So meron po kami, dahil sa ending niyo sir, may meron po kaming katanungan. What are the points of convergence or points of collaboration po between your organization as well as the academe both CHE and at the same time um, the Academe we're in, ma'am. Blessy is uh, currently representing. Sir Ben, baka po pwede ninyong ma-expound. Thank you po. Yes po. Uh, for now po, uh, as I've mentioned, we are working on the Climate Resilience Human Settlements Framework with the Department of Human Settlements and Urban Development. Uh, we are starting to draft it. Uh, we are actually, uh, we have started drafting it. At, uh, Siguro po uh, ito pwede namin itong i-share sa, sa College of Human Ecology for, uh, for, for your comments, especially for, from your uh, particular expertise and to ensure yung sinasabi nga kanina ni Ron na uh, transdisciplinary uh, co-production of knowledge. No? I, I, that's uh, siguro yun yung, yun din yung maganda natin siguro ma, ma-practice, no? the yung salimbayan or yung exchanges of the academe and the uh, practitioners or the NGOs or the or any uh, organization working outside the academe kasi yun yung magtatahi talaga of uh, the co-production no ng knowledge it, it hindi siya magbabayas on the academic presentation and it's not only bias on the practical sense no ng practitioners so Yun po, yun po yung um, yung isang uh, isang bagay na pwedeng natin pagsimulan yung pong pagbuo natin ng climate resilience human settlements framework po ng ng Pilipinas no po. Okay, thank you very much for that sir and I'm sure CHE as well as the Eastern Samar State University are excited with this kind of collaboration. Doc bless Vinolunteer na po namin ang <laughs> Eastern Summer. <laughs> Pero we really hope po that through this webinar, we are also able to forge partnership, not just within the academe, but with the development sector. So uh, as much as we would want to continue, we will have our final question na po. Uh, and this is for all our speakers. This is pro from Professor Dangkalan. Uh, given all the presentations, he wants to ask if there are concrete examples wherein the CHE framework was used in CCA DRR initiative or any program in your field of expertise. So, uh, volunteer na lang po kung sino pong gustong maunang sumagot. Thank you very much po. Ako na rin ulit ma'am kasi medyo unstable yata yung internet ko ba mawala. So, Thank you so much uh, po. Yeah, yes ma'am. Opo, uh, always naman we in the IHNF as part of the College of Human Ecology or we are very conscious in following uh, the college uh, research and extension plans and also the university, you know, mission, vision, and also the 
uh, ngayon nga agora na no so we have this agora so we always uh, it's good that actually sa ano naman talaga as explained by Sir Ron kanina talaga no very important yung health nutrition and actually may human ecological concept talaga ang ano ang field namin sa nutrition very much ano talaga kami human ecologists kung talagang kung tutuusin talaga no so so our research is plants nowadays really is more on the health uh, public health and uh, uh, looking at uh, looking also at the ano uh, sustainable development goals we are still in on the uh, researches and mga extension activities on promoting food and nutrition security and zero hunger so as much as possible no so we look at our environment not only the social but also the physical environment in making sure that food and nutrition security will be achieved or attained mm -hmm. parang ganun po ma Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much po, Doc Amy. Um, very exciting times for CHE when it comes to the trajectory po, especially in the field of, field of nutrition and human nutrition and impact, human nutrition. Thank you very much po, ma'am Amy. Sir Ben? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah. I think very, very relevant and very call this, practiced yung uh, transdisciplinary approach in uh, planning. No? Uh, well, it always started naman in, on all planning uh, group that it is multi-expert. Uh, multi but at the end of the day, you should have uh, a common analysis. No? It should speak and not in siloed analysis. And that I think yun yung pinapakita ng funnel kanina na presentation your own and that's how we deal uh, with uh, with uh, with developing plans and even doing designs uh, we we try to uh, put in uh, an architect or a landscape designer in face of the community and talk about it to have the technical insights and the community needs directly uh, uh, pinagbabangga natin no pinagpo-proseso natin sila nang sa kanila no at uh, hindi tayo nagmi-middleman doon but we allow them to to speak so i think that's uh, in terms of uh, field practice that's how we do it and that uh, that gives us a uh, high one uh, uptake of the community that we are working with and also on the uh, on the end of the technical expert uh, another uh, considerations when you again do the same project on different community so nag expand din yung manner of practice niya hindi lang uh, hindi lang siya nakatapos o nakabuo kasi as as practitioner we also uh, adjust we also develop we also uh, uh, take considerations of our experiences on our next projects so i think that's how i see it uh, with with, uh, with how we did the uh, projects in urban design in Irma. Thank you very much po for expounding more on the uh, practices and the uh, way of designing uh, na ginagawa po ninyo, Sir Ben, and at the same time also for um, advocating and um, including the essence of participatory planning. Um, Emmy, let's hear it from you po. Yes, ma'am. Uh, you know, let me very let me be very uh, straight and uh, strong about this. No, that uh, the future really of human ecology is in uh, the transdisciplinary approach and uh, perspective. This is not to undermine um, the the utility, no, and and the contribution of uh, disciplines, no, and multi, uh, and and uh, you even unilat unidisciplinary uh, approaches. But uh, you know, uh, we do not have the answers to everything, and uh, and uh, you you will be surprised. We will be surprised that uh, many of our questions are actually already being lived. No, uh, in their in the everyday lives of uh, people in our uh, community, there's just so much to learn from our communities and uh, from those whose voices we usually do not uh, hear. And so uh, we really need uh, 
transdisciplinary perspective so that we can genuinely co-create with them you know, the answers to uh, that we are all commonly uh, facing. Uh, co-create, uh, collaborate, um, and, and discuss with them. Um, it is imperative that uh, uh, we do that, no? Uh, because uh, unless we do that, uh, we will just be in our silos. We will just be in our big, boastful uh, bubbles, no? Um, transdisciplinary approach is exciting, uh, but it also requires a certain... Uh, attitudes no uh, and 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 principles uh, for one uh, ang maganda sa kanya uh, it is it is uh, anto, it is uh, built no on the principle of humility no so isa yun sa pinakamagandang ano and and then you listen to people around you and this is what we need really if uh, we can move forward in a world that is you know unpredictable and sabi nga it's a VUCA world out there and we need to you know hold hands together okay and that, that's what we do in human ecology and that's what is exciting about this college yun lang po Well said from all of our speakers. Um, we've really learned a lot and we've also uh, made, uh, they've also asked us to look inside us uh, para mas makapag-reflect pa in terms of the direction of transdisciplinary approach when it comes to managing disasters, disaster risks as well as climate change adaptation and promoting climate change adaptation. And also in terms of preparing, not just uh, in terms of living, living healthily, uh, preparing the communities and our urban spaces for uh, a better, uh, and at the same time, our conducive and safe environment. And also in terms of designing responsive social services. So with that, amidst the vulnerable and complex world that we are in now. So with that, we end this open forum. Uh, let me turn it over to Mampach. Thank you very much, Bob. Oh, that was like really great answers from all of our speakers. And thank you so much. Um, there's There was a lot that uh, was said. It's really hard actually to come up with like one um one final sentence here but before we move on um we will uh, let me just share my screen again we would like to award uh give our sincerest thanks to our speakers today we would like to present um this a certificate of appreciation to each of the speakers this one is for prof ron j dankalan for serving as a resource speaker on the webinar Unpacking the Value of Transdisciplinary Approach in CAADRR, organized as part of the HUME 123 Climate Change Adaptation and Disaster Risk Reduction in Human Ecosystems course of the College of Human Ecology, held this uh, 27th of November 2021 via Zoom and signed by our one and only Dean Ricardo S. M. Sandalo. And uh, so the following slides would show the same for Doc Amy and K. Prof. Emmy and K. Sir Ben. And obviously, K. Uh, last but not the least, to Doc Blessy Badok for her um, insights. Uh, Oops, I think I did not share the sound na naman dito. Wait, I have to stop this because hindi naka-share ang sound. <laughs> uh, so our closing actually is um, by um, Prof. Mene uh, de Mesa and she who is one of our, um, who is one of the, I think in two sections, Vito, for Hume 1, 2, 3, uh, she, had, she prepared a video.
We came here today with a recognition and a common understanding Oops, sorry. of climate change and this sorry. disaster risk as a wicked problem experienced in our human ecosystems, a reality that we are facing nowadays. As a wicked problem, climate and disaster risks demand multi-sectoral involvement and transdisciplinary collaborations across scale and beyond borders, a seemingly daunting tasks, but we believe is doable. The webinar presented different facets of the transdisciplinary approaches of human ecology in tackling CCA and DRR as expressed in the topics of nutrition in times of emergencies, delivery of death and disaster-related social services, and urban design for resilient cities. From these topics, we challenge our students to observe the points of convergence and actions, critique the disjoint and inconsistence, or just have something to take away on how human ecology as a transdisciplinary field can be applied to CCA and DRR. At this point, let me thank our invited resource speakers who provided their expertise, experiences, and knowledge to us this afternoon. Mom Amy Barion, Kuya Ben Aguijon, and our reactor, Dr. Dr. Blessy Badok Gonzalez. To the participants, and of course, to our Yuma 123 students, who actively joined us in this two-hour webinar. And to our Yuma 123 faculty in charge, Sir Ron, Mom Emmy, Mom Grace, and Mom Patch for organizing such timely and relevant webinar. Let me leave our students with a quote from the great Albert Einstein for them to ponder on. The world will not be destroyed by those who do evil but by those who watch them without doing anything. Good day to everyone. And with that, before we end, can we request that uh, the students and all of our other participants who are joining us um, today to turn on their cameras for a quick uh, photo opportunity. I will stop this sharing so that we can um, open all our cams and prepare our smiles. Uh, we actually have four pages. Sir Ron, can you help me also take a uh, backup? Sure, I'll take the picture, Mom Patch. No? So uh, for in, in my case, it's just two. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, can we all open our camera, please? And then I'll take a picture to see all the beautiful and handsome faces that you all have. Okay. Smile, everybody. Sige po. Thank you. One, two, three. Sa pa. Now for the second slide, can I go in? One, two, three. Ayan, thank you po for everyone who came. No, meron pa tayo from Palawan, from Samar. I think from Mindanao, we, all, we also have someone here. Thank you, Bicol also. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you for And yes, last but very, very, very not the least. Um, Sir Ron has, uh, Sir, yeah, Sir Ron has already uh, included in our uh, chat box, please evaluate our webinar at the, at the link that is flashed here. It's also in the chat box. Thank you to everyone who took their time this Saturday afternoon to learn how important it is to integrate our different domains with the final goal of enhancing how all Filipinos can respond um, to the hazards and to minimize the impacts of climate change in our country. Thank you so much to everyone who was able to join us. And uh, any last words, mga FICs, for our students? End the seminar. Joke lang. <laughs>
we we all in kami na yung mam Billy Merry Christmas Merry Christmas Happy Holidays Mam Um, Patch, uh, Mamet, thank you so much, mga kasaguan. Maraming maraming salamat and um, for the call laborship. Mama Patch, thank you so much for uh, really an excellent hosting. And uh, Ma'am Amy, maraming salamat. And Sir Ben and Ma'am Blessy. Happy oh, anniversary man. to Che. Happy anniversary, anniversary Che. Happy anniversary. Happy 47th year. Opo, <laughs> nandun sila sa ibang Zoom room. <laughs> We are all everywhere. <laughs> We are all everywhere. So many webinars today. <laughs> Thank you for all. Thank you po. Thank you. 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 Thank you.